everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, we will start with a Pledge of Allegiance. So join me with our right hands over our hearts. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance yes, to the flag, to the flag United of the United States of America, to the to Republic, Republic which, it stands, which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty and, and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, for items number three and four on the agenda, we have not received any public comment. So I will go to our introductions and I would first like to introduce our guest from Texas, Mr. A.J. Crabill. So welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Taking us on this journey and, and helping. So um, shall we get started? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a joy to get to uh, join you all again. Um, as a way of getting started, I uh, just want to go around and give uh, each of the board members, um, as well as the superintendent, an opportunity to um, uh, just share a little bit about um, what kind of most resonates with you, uh, kind of what uh, most has you interested in doing the work we're doing. Uh, this work around getting really clear about the the priorities of the board um, and then beginning the process of redesigning the board's work in such a way that it is constantly monitoring progress relative to those priorities and, and redesigning uh, how the board behaves and how the board invests time uh, to demonstrate the urgency of those priorities. And so I just will go around and give each board member an opportunity to uh, uh, join the conversation and then um, com completing that uh, with the superintendent. What is it about this work that uh, causes you to want to be doing it? Uh, because, and, and the reason I ask that is because when boards do this work well, you're intentionally bringing about some amount of disruption to the organization. You're, you're intentionally disrupting adult behavior um, and so it begs the question, why would you choose to behave that way? Why would you choose to cause disruption in an organization? So for all those reasons, I just want to open up uh, board members uh, first and then superintendent. Uh, welcome to the conversation. Why do you choose to be involved in this work? Um, I'll go ahead and start us out. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction. When we started this process, the part that really um, was attractive to me was that the work of the board would directly affect student outcomes. And that resonated with me because that's why I got into this work. Yeah. And to, to be guided in a direction that our work would be more meaningful that the student outcomes will improve because of that work that's that's all it took for me really and i believe we have a good board we had a good board when we started this process i still believe we have a good board but we can be better so i'm all for doing the work i'm all for being a positive disruptor and making changes that will you know be our legacy really so I am all for it. Welcome. So much like my colleague Diana, I, um, I got into the work because I care about students achieving and students doing well. Um, and one of the things that I was aware of after the first day of this work um, was we absolutely can do a better job, not only on focusing on that, but demonstrating to our community that we're focused on that. Uh, I don't think there could be a better time for us to embark on this work, not because of COVID, but because of the natural transitions that have happened um, in our leadership and in our board, and that we have an opportunity moving forward to make really intentional choices to do even better work for our students. And so I want to be a part of doing that work. I know it won't be easy, uh, but I look forward to doing hard work to benefit our students. 
Thank you for sharing. I guess I'll go next. Thanks, AJ. Uh, so very similar to my colleagues. Um, I'm very interested in, in focusing better our attention energies and board resources around student outcomes. And um, I think positive disruption is a good thing. Uh, so if that's what it takes, uh, that's great. And um, I also think that there's already a good anchor around our equity, uh, leading with equity and our, and our equity language and our equity work that we've already been doing. So I think the, the foundation is strong for us to improve in those areas that um, we prioritize uh, as a board. So I'm looking forward to uh, advancing uh, our equity vision uh, and strategies. Thank you for sharing. Mr. Otto, you're muted. about that is that better yeah. okay great Welcome. so i i've been interested for a very long time in interest in issues of governance um and uh i was on the planning commission and did a whole bunch of things a long time ago but i chaired a strategic planning process for the city of long beach about 20 years ago and uh, we did something that was pretty sneaky, and that was that we got new new chairmen that had never been done done task, task force chairs before, and yet at the end we wrote a report that focused on results, mm -hmm. and everybody said, "Where did that come from?" I, said, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it just it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's it's crazy talk, Doug. Crazy talk. Uh, and the city of Long Beach did that for a while. And just about that time, I, in my constant musings about what was a good thing to do, thought oh, education is really what it's all about. And so I ran for and served on the community college board for a long time and did things there all the time thinking about governance. And uh, uh, that kind of went sideways for a whole variety of reasons. And um, uh, I... Uh, decided to seek and got this job. And yet it was just another step in, okay, what does this mean? And how does governance do here? And um, and then I read this stuff and I went, say what? Uh, that, I haven't seen anything like this before. Uh, let, me, let me look at this. And uh, I didn't understand it. And then I kind of understood it. And then I read it again. In fact, I've just recopied all of my notes from Monday uh, and tried to organize them and went, okay, I'm beginning to get this. It's brand new to me. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I guess it's not completely brand new, but it's, it's very exciting. Uh, and uh, it's mostly exciting because it has to do with what I consider to be the fundamental thing that people can do. Uh, at this level, it's really about the kids uh, or it's about the students. Uh, whereas, but the political stuff, it's all about where am I going and uh, uh, how can I uh, uh, make myself look good. And uh, uh, but this is just God's work. And uh, and to, to think about ways to do it better has been very exciting. So um, that's why I am attracted to this work. And uh, uh, I didn't think you could uh, could hit me upside the head like that. But. Uh, but you kind of have, and I'm interested in learning, learning a little bit more. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. May I jump in? Thank you, please. So I'm excited about this work because we exist for the purpose of ensuring that students learn. That is at the essence of our existence as a public school system. Um, and I believe that excellence and equity to be operationalized in a school district and for staff to be able to activate on the combination of those two things, there has to be a vision by the Board of Education that just focuses on students in policy, in fiscal oversight, and the decisions that are made around our finances, and of course, accountability, accountability of me, 
which then in turn is accountability of staff, um, accountability of doing what we say that we'll do. Um, and so I believe in that. I also think, as has been said, that there's a foundation in this district about centering students. Um, and so it's building on that foundation and making that even more present in a, in a governance team that really leads with student outcomes in mind, but really uplifting that. And I also think it's a really special moment in time for us. So our world has been disrupted over the last year and our organization has been disrupted. So we've had just multiple transitions, superintendent transition, six senior staff transition. We've had all kinds of transitions in the field and we've had board transition. And so I can't think of a better time. And I think Mrs. Curry, you led off with that too. This moment feels like a disrupted moment that allows us to really reimagine. And I see the end goal as our new strategic plan. And so I know we're a long way from that, but I'm holding that vision out in front of me and just knowing that the, there will be a lot of hard work between now and then, um, but I think we're ready for it and I'm excited about it. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> And then, uh, um, and I think we're being joined uh, by one more board member. Um, and so the invitation, I was just to um, welcome everyone into the space by inviting uh, each board member uh, and the superintendent to share um, what, why is it that you choose to do this work, this work that causes the board to get focused in on what are the top priorities of the community, what's one of the community's vision and values, um, and, and why, why do you choose to engage in this work? Um, uh, Eric, are you with us? Yeah, I am. And I apologize for the delay. One of my meetings ran over. Uh, for me, the passion of doing this work is thinking about uh, the great opportunities that I've been afforded and looking at previous friends and family members and seeing their potential, but knowing that I was fortunate enough to have uh, grown up in the Long Beach Unified School District and have that support and trying to create an environment uh, similar to the great environment that I had for kids that also are suffering from any form of uh, barrier to reaching their full potential. Thank you for sharing. Um, one other, uh, a few other questions to um, kind of confirm the space um, um, before we start diving into the specific things we're gonna do today. Um, we've had a lot of conversation in the past, but I just wanna you know, recenter us in this. What, what differences do you remember are there between adult inputs and student outcomes? What do you remember as being the distinction between adult inputs and student outcomes? What do you remember? Um, any board members or superintendent, what do you remember the differences between adult inputs and student outcomes? And, and for bonus points, why does that difference matter? <laughs> why is this something a board might want to know? Uh, who will be the first to share? Um, I'll be the first to share on that. Um, from what I remember, the uh, first time we met was that <clears throat> the adult inputs are the actions that the adult that the adults take and the student yeah. outcomes are the um are the end results of, of those actions yeah and um well, why, why does that matter why would a board need to know the difference between those two that matters because the board needs to focus on the student outcomes and that needs to be the <clears throat> the primary focus for our, our our governance and the decisions that we make so and you're saying this adult inputs aren't important? No, they are important, but it's an uh, ends to a mean. And it's how we it's how we get to those student outcomes. Uh, uh, who else? What do you remember about the difference between uh, adult inputs and student outcomes? And why does that distinction matter? Who will be the next to share? Yeah, Juan. So I remember our student outcomes being directly aligned with community's vision yeah uh, and as a board our primary responsibility is to uphold uh the community <laughs> vision that we were elected uh by to represent well why, why would why would you know the superintendent 
you know, she seems like a really great educator. She's been with the you know, district for a while. She she understands the community. Why wouldn't what's wrong with her um, identifying the vision? Why, why, why are you suggesting the board should do that? Well, because we were elected by community members to represent their vision and thereby their interests. And I think that's where our shared governance model on clearly being clearly defining what that vision is and clearly prioritizing as our board as a board provide provides I'm going to cite one of the documents that you had us read AJ some guardrails for ourselves and our superintendent yeah. to act um, in synchronization uh, yeah. on, around that vision. Uh, if the job of the board is to represent the vision and values of the community, then what's the job of the superintendent? She's the person that we hired to do the day-to-day -day work to make sure that we achieve the outcomes that are part of the vision of the community. And then she manages and evaluates a staff that helps in that work. Got it. Uh, any other reflections on this? What's the difference between adult inputs and student outcomes and why does that matter? Any other reflections on this before we transition? I'll just say that I remember this was Monica's burrito example, and it's all the things yes. that get us to student outcomes. Um, it's the programs, it's the textbooks, it's the school site, it's the great teachers, it's all of those things that are absolutely critical to student outcomes, but um, they aren't the student outcomes. They're what help oh. make the ingredient for the student outcomes. Yes, I will always remember uh, <laughs> that example she gives. Um, <laughs> is there a she was saying, like some people don't know how to make beans why <laughs> that's not going to make the burrito you want uh, but even if the beans are perfect just because you have perfect beans doesn't mean that students are full it doesn't mean that you've achieved the outcome you are um, and so yeah there's this difference between the, the ingredients and the result uh, anyone else uh, distinction between adult inputs and student outcomes before we transition any other thoughts on this I don't know if this is responsive, but um, uh, the process itself kind of, I'll use a funny word, reifies the, uh, what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, yeah. if, if we, as people in the community, elected by the community, or who have a job of listening to the community and fine tuning what they come up with, then work with, uh, the staff and in particular the superintendent to it, it's not about us it's not about what we think it's about the, the the process of working together to do this has a has it puts a break on the uh, idiosyncratic nature of leadership that sometimes puts itself out yeah So one of the things that's happened since the last time uh, we came together um, was that we, uh, you know, Monica and I took the feedback from you all and certainly the one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, uh, conversations that we've had uh, in the small group conversations um, and tried to apply that to a timeline that would describe uh, here are steps in the process and what that look like. A large part of our work today is to go through that timeline, um, firm up pieces of it, identify variables that all, as board members only you can identify um, and try to reach some sense of consensus around um, the extent to which the board is prepared uh, to proceed on this path and do this work, recognizing that as you look at the timeline, this is a significant investment of uh, energy on the part of the board. Um, and so before we dive into that, any questions about that document? Uh, what we'll be digging into is a document you know, called the uh, Board Implementation Timeline. So if you don't have that handy, you want to go ahead and you know, pull that up. Um, any questions uh, before we dive into it? Overarching questions um, about this document or things that didn't make sense or you just don't have a copy and we need to send you one? All right, uh, then I will jump in uh, on the first page of the document describes the overview. 
Uh, this is the overview uh, that we drafted um, in response to uh, things that you all identified again, both in you know whole group sessions as well as one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, but there are three main objectives that you all wanted to accomplish. One is just to really create clarity around um, the community's vision and values uh, that you as a team, particularly as a new board, uh, newly seated, um, you know, to make clear for yourselves what you see as being the high priority vision of the community. Uh, what does the community want students to know and be able to do and codify that um, um, into a set of goals? Um, what are the high priority values of the community? The things that are the non-negotiables that the community wants to see honored um, and then codify that into a set of guardrails. Um, and then after you've identified community's vision and values, after you've codified them into a set of goals and guardrails, then begin the process of modifying uh, all of your board behaviors and procedures uh, to be in alignment with the goals and guardrails that you've identified. Um, and then finally, the third item uh, that you all expressed an interest in saying was redesigning how the board uses its time, uh, specifically with an intention on making progress monitoring relative to uh, the goals that you have for student learning uh, a such a central part of your work that that actually uh, becomes half of how the time the board uses its time uh, each month um, and making the calendar and agenda adjustments necessary to pull that off. Uh, so let me just uh, check in. What reflections do you have on any of those three objectives as captured here? Uh, and this would be the time that if uh, Monica and I miscaptured uh, your intentions or your expectations or your thoughts on the matter, this would be the time to clarify that. Uh, the, the, the intention of this work is to be a reflection of the will of the board. Um, and then our job is to help you identify how to implement the will of the board uh, as it relates to your own governance work. Uh, but first, we should make sure that we correctly understood and have articulated back to you uh, the things that you've said to us. Uh, so what questions, comments do you have about any of those three objectives uh, here in this on the page one in the overview section? The uh, floor is open um, and certainly uh, Madam Superintendent, I want you to jump in as well. Is there points of clarity uh, that you, uh, clarity or comments that you have as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, so this work seems to go hand in hand uh, with what Dr. Baker alluded to in terms of the re uh, the re upping of our strategic plan that comes due. So we're currently operating under goals that were from a strategic plan from 2017, I believe, was the start date on that. So it feels like this will be this process will be a modification of the strategic plan because I don't know that we can have goals that are smart goals. Um, in this process that won't be reflected in a new strategic plan. So um, not really a question, just an observation that as we do this, um, it feels like we won't necessarily do a whole strategic plan process on top of that, but making sure that we're honoring how we include this, the community in that in this building, because it may very well result in what is very close to our final strategic plan. Yeah, um, and so when we think of strategic planning, uh, just as a recap, uh, we think of it as occurring in two phases. Phase one is the board uh, grounded in its job of representing the vision and values of the community, says here's where we have to go um, and here are our guiding values. Here, here are, here's the vision of the community and where we should go and our guiding values uh, It must be honored on the journey. Here are our goals and guardrails. That's phase one. That's owned by the board and the board alone. They do it in partnership with the superintendent and guided by feedback from the community, but ultimately the decision comes down to the board. What will our goals and our be? The second phase then in strategic planning is the superintendent uh, receives from the board uh, its adopted goals and guardrails and said, now I will come back to you with a high level uh, uh, implementation plan at the strategic level, not at the tactical level but at the strategic level, uh, an implementation plan that describes how, uh, what are the major levers that we will have to pull over the next five years in order to accomplish uh, the board's goals while honoring the board's guardrails. Um, and so when we think strategic planning, those are the two pieces we think of. And so 
what you all currently have is a strategic plan you're operating under. The intention then of this process would be to create just rock solid clarity from the board on what you say are the community's vision and values and codify those as goals and guardrails and hand that to the superintendent so she can use that as uh, source material for updating your existing strategic plan and whatever parts of it are currently in alignment hold on to that and really double down and if there are any parts that uh, aren't perfectly in alignment you know make the tweaks necessary uh, so that the organization can move forward um, matching uh, the leadership offered by the board other questions common reflections one aj just a question right now on, on the process that you just described um so can you talk a little bit more or or, sh or shall it be us around um you use the word decide the board decides all right does that mean um decides by policy uh decides that we have a conversation and provide some direction uh that we you know have, it, have kind of yeah in, in terms of your goals and guardrails, that's something yeah. that you all would we need to draft, okay. and then you all would need to adopt, and then that is adopted as policy. Okay, uh, that that is that is the so when we think of policy, we think of policy as the written codified uh, codification of the community's vision and values. Okay. So when you see a policy manual, this is this is the board's effort to really condense into written language the collective vision of values in the community. That's what policy is. And so when we talk about your goals and guardrails, those are policies that you all would adopt. They're, they're you really condensing down what is the what are the high priority, high need, high leverage uh, vision of values of our community, um, and then condense that down to just one to five, preferably just you know, one to three uh, guiding uh, policy statements that you can adopt. Uh, on the case of, in the case of goals, those are actually adopted as smart goals. So the, these are not generic. We hope children do good. You know, it, it's it's much more specific. It's, it's the board being much more intentional, saying we have to narrowly uh, dive in. Uh, this is where it gets uncomfortable because your district is huge. And so there's no shortage of needs to be found. You know, there are probably a hundred different areas minimum where you could reasonably attend to and people would think that that was responsible behavior. So the really hard part is saying of all of those hundred that we could possibly lead into, what are the three areas that are highest need, highest leverage that we have to win here first to set us up for larger wins for students down the road? That is a really hard task. And to be blunt, many elected officials don't enjoy doing that because focusing, even though it sets you up to actually be successful at what you're doing, doesn't always win you friends. Like people aren't going to applaud you for not adopting the thing that is most important to them. But this is what effective governance looks like. It looks like uh, dealing with the reality that you have to communicate to folks why we are narrowing in on a, on a finite set of priorities, uh, why it is that doing that actually sets us up for larger successes for our students than if we actually adopted a hundred different goals. And so, yes, you all will adopt that in the policy that is a choice that the board must make. Yeah, Doug? Yeah, one, one of my questions is, um, what's the toolkit that we use to get that? Um, yeah. Uh, I, uh, uh, I just got off a Zoom call right before here where we were talking about drafting a questionnaire to the church congregation that I'm a member of to see how and if they want to go back to uh, to uh, worshiping in person when they can uh, and uh, and how the world has changed and uh, that's one way another way is talking to your friends another way is uh, talking to people that aren't your friends uh, the other one another way is community forums where you say what do you think uh, usually it's issue specific because uh, the number of people that show up when you say, I want to talk about our guardrails is going to be zero. Um, <laughs> it's probably not the, probably not the draw. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, anyway, the, it, what's that toolkit? So, uh, so the first part of understanding that is there are two key sources of information that the board will rely on in establishing a set of goals. Uh, the first source of information, not surprisingly, is current data about student performance. Like it's hard to prior know which student 
which areas of student performance to prioritize if you're not actually looking at data about student performance. And so uh, for that part of your toolkit, uh, you'll actually be relying usually on your superintendent, though some uh, boards ask local universities or other partners like that to weigh in. But usually what you'll receive is a one to three page analysis from your superintendent uh, that describes here are the high need, high leverage areas for our students. And, they, and when they bring it back to you, it's probably going to be, you know, three, four, five, ten, you know, maybe even as many as 20 different areas. So here are the areas that we have to win in, that we have to operationalize around successfully in order to uh, attend to, you know, the most urgent, high need, high leverage needs of our students. Um, and so that's the first piece of information. You know, there are two key pieces of information you use for making these decisions. The first is the actual data about your students. Without that, you cannot make rational choices, period. There, there is no way to do that. Uh, making decisions without that data is basically relying on Twitter to be your governance guide. Uh, this is not something we recommend. Um, so that's the first source of information. The second source of information that the board uses, also not surprisingly, is community feedback. If your job is to represent the vision values of the community, at some point you're actually going to need to engage with community members. Uh, and part of our work you know, that Monica and I will do is you know, support you through that process. What that generally looks like, there, there's really two different uh, ways of connecting with community to listen for their vision and values that we're going to coach you into. Way one, we refer to as community engagement. Way two, we refer to as community outreach. Community engagement, this is when you host a meeting and you invite people to it. Community outreach, this is when somebody else is hosting a meeting and you show up at it. Simple and plain. And so as board members, you'll need to make the decision, how much community engagement do we need to do? How many sessions do we need to host? And for whom do we need to host them? We'll have you all uh, send us lists. We'll compile it all, you know, or your staff will compile it all into a big spreadsheet. And then you all will sift through and decide, okay, we've got these hundreds, some odd different key stakeholders. Um, how many sessions, community engagement sessions do we need to host? And in how many different ways in order to authentically connect with and engage with those stakeholders? Then you'll also talk about community outreach. Some people are never going to show up at your meeting. They'll be like, Doug's hosting a meeting. I'm absolutely not going to that. That sounds horrible. Um, and so that's not going to work out for you. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to figure out who are the people who are not going to come to us and where can we go to them? What are existing meetings that are already happening in the community, existing conversations that are already taking place that we can get on the invite list, we can get on the agenda, and we can go to them and it, uh, and have a conversation around uh, the vision and values of the community. These are the two key ways of reaching out and listening for the community's vision and values that we're going to recommend to you. Community engagement, where you're hosting and kind of pulling people towards you who you know are engaged, necessary stakeholders to connect with, uh, and community outreach, where you're going to places where the community is already actively involved. Uh, so, so those are the two ways of getting access to the sense of the community's vision and values. And that, and, and listening to the community's vision and values is one of the two key sources of information. You use the community's vision and values and you use student data. Uh, so let me pause for a second. Uh, Doug, is that responsive to your inquiry? Yes, it doesn't answer the question, but it is responsive. Uh, <laughs> okay, then let's... Uh, <laughs> no, no, but, it, but it's good. I mean, I, I'm sitting here thinking, um, so how do you reach the people that you're not reaching uh, through uh, community outreach? Uh, do you, is it important to identify them and find sneaky ways to uh, yeah. their input somehow? I, I mean, I think that must be part of it. I, I, one of my yeah. statistics. So, so let's, let's chop the world into three buckets. You know, all the people who are going to show up at a meeting – um, that you host, all the people who aren't going to show up at a meeting that you host, but are showing up at another meeting that mm -hmm. you can get access to, and all the people who aren't showing up at anybody's meetings. There's not a lot you could do about group three. I mean, there are some folks who simply don't want to be bothered. They have other priorities in life, and they have the right to have other priorities. Literally, they elected you to deal with this on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So group three, um, if folks are not interested in showing up at not only your meetings, but no one else's meetings, uh, then so be it. In practice, it actually winds up being a smaller group than you might realize. Uh, because th this group of people who have no interest in showing up at your meeting, but are probably showing up at someone else's meeting, is actually quite large. Your biggest task then is figuring out where are they already showing up. For a lot of these people, 
they're showing up. They, they have a congregation they're showing up at. Okay, great. So the, what are we doing to reach them there? You know, or they have, you know, children who are involved in scouting. Okay, great. So how are we reaching them there? Or they're showing up at their neighborhood association meeting, you know, or they have some other affinity group, or maybe they're in Rotary. Or, uh, there's this endless supply of ways that people engage in belonging. Your task as the representatives of the community's vision and values is to tap into those to the extent that you all believe is necessary to have authentically garnered a sense of the vision and values of the community. There's only five of you. So there's a finite amount of this engagement that you're going to do, which means you're going to have to prioritize. That being said, I have seen boards just like yours um, host seven uh, engagements and do you know, 10 outreach sessions and call it a day. I've seen other boards host 50 engagement sessions and do 70 outreach sessions uh, before calling it a day. Um, it's all in how much work do you believe is necessary to do to authentically tap into the vision and values of the community. Um, but that doesn't need to be limited to who's gonna come to you. But it is generally limited to who will come to you plus who are you willing to go out uh, and connect with? Um, there, there is one other path, but it's not really, I, I, I will not recommend that you go door to door right now. So I have worked with other boards that have just literally taken it door to door. In fact, my board did this, but we just, we just went to the streets. We, we created a flyer that basically summarized what we would have shared with them in a town hall meeting if they had come to it. And then we just went door to door and just knocked on people's doors and had a distributed town hall meeting, you know, by foot over the course of four weekends. I won't recommend that to you. I, I just don't know that that is um, a, a responsible choice right now. Um, and so when you take that off the table, that leaves you with community outreach and community engagement. Gotcha. Okay. Megan? Yeah, I have a quick question. So on the outcome focused framework that you've given us, um, it talks about a listening session within the last 36 months. So pre COVID, which feels like 8 million years ago, which was <laughs> a year ago, we engaged in a process around our superintendent search that included upwards of 10 to 20 of those community engagement type of yeah. sessions. And I, I'm assuming we still have a ton of data. We have all of the, the responses that came in online. We documented all of the public comment at yeah. all of those individual meetings. Is that, and because it was pre COVID, I think the questions that we asked were around what do we envision what qualities do you want yeah. to see in a superintendent? Is that, I know it was a year ago, is that data that we can pull into this work to supplement the work that we'll do currently? That sounds like really valuable data. I would absolutely not use it. And then you answered my second question, I think, is that in these engagement sessions that there will be a, a, a universal language or language that we as a board have decided on how we will approach so that as each of us go out to potentially neighborhood association meetings or congregations that we're speaking a similar language? Uh, so part of what we'll do to support you all, uh, it is really counterproductive, you know, for Eric to go to one part of town, um, and Juan to go to another part of town, um, and hold conversations. And the one person went to both sessions and heard radically different things that actually sets you up to fail children, not to serve children. Um, and so this idea of having a shared vocabulary, this isn't, uh, this isn't revolutionary. Um, we know this from the leadership of schools. If all of the adults in the school building are speaking the same language about how they serve children, they're more likely to be able to serve children well because uh, they're not talking you know, past each other. Um, and so this having a shared language and communicating with your community in a shared uh, matter is actually quite important uh, to setting you up to be successful. So toward that end, that's part of what Monica and I will do to support you all. Uh, is, you know, we will uh, interview you again, uh, listen for exactly what are the things you all want to communicate and, and what, what you want that two-way conversation with your community to look like, um, you know, what you want the conversation to be. And we'll take all that, synthesize it into a community listening script uh, that you can then use when you go out to uh, host your um, engagement sessions or when you uh, go and serve as a guest at your outreach sessions. Uh, and so there does need to be a script, uh, but uh, we will do the listening to you all and use what we hear to develop said script. 
Yeah, Jim. Hey, Jim, I'm curious about a couple of things. Um, the first is, in your experience, how students are incorporated into this process. Uh -huh. If there's a place for recent graduates or those high school juniors and seniors that have been in the system, many of them since preschool. Yeah. What, where does that fit into this? And I guess the second thing is um, in talking about the engagement and outreach, um, I think you're also, when, especially when you talk about outreach, I think you're also thinking about or you're including things that might be less formal and more very organic to a neighborhood, um, not necessarily knocking on doors, but I, I would just like us to think innovatively because we often have a group of of um, families that don't participate in traditional ways, but they have a lot to say. And so I know we've got some expertise on the board and ways that you've engaged in the public. Um, Dr. Benitez runs a clinic for, for engagement at the university and may have some ideas to bring in. I just like us to think beyond just what we can think of today around how we get input from the community. Yeah, um, I'll take the second part. Uh, first, it, you're right. It's absolutely critical that as the board is thinking about, uh, and, and again, this is the, the board's task is to represent the vision and values of the community. You all, the five of you, and only the five of you can make the determination of when have we sufficiently, you know, as a group of five folks, when have we sufficiently engaged? And when you all feel that you've reached that, that's when you stop. If you all don't feel like you've reached that, the, um, then as a team, you keep going. Um, and the engagement is always going to kind of connect with a pretty predictable group of individuals. It's really the outreach where your creativity will most come into play. That's why I said, um, you know, I, I think the example I gave is like, if there's a bunch of kids in a scouting troop, like maybe you need to go, you know, beam into that scouting troop. Like, you know, I, I would not limit you to uh, in, in any way. The only limit I described was people are already showing up together somewhere. Your task is to figure where that somewhere is. And, and maybe that somewhere you know, is you know, an AA meeting or you know, you know, who, who knows, but wherever it is, that's it's you, your job as a board to make the determination, where do we need to go? Who all do we need to connect with? And, and let's do it. Uh, one other caveat on that that you all should know, um, board members um, in this process, it is never appropriate for board members to go anywhere solo. So there will always be two of you at any of these, whether it's an engagement or outreach, you will always go two by two. There'll never be you know, one board member solo. Um, uh, and so when you start thinking about the list of all the places we need to go, it's not just gonna be you going, it's gonna be you and a partner. Uh, or in a lot of cases, we'll actually recommend if there's a place that you are already well known, actually you don't go to that one. Why don't you send two other board members so they can have a, so they can hear firsthand what the needs of the community that you already know about are, and you go to another place where you have less familiarity with, so you can hear firsthand the needs of communities that you know, don't normally interact with. Um, so we'll encourage folks to mix it up, you know, have a different partner. Don't definitely don't go with the same board member partner every time. You know, if you're going to have you know dozen you know different sessions, then try to you know. You know, make sure that you have parted up with at least all four of your colleagues. And so that kind of being creative and uh, being intentional about going to where your community members are, that is uh, that is really important, but it's limited only by your creativity. In terms of the student portion, uh, yes. So if you look at the rubric, your work is not, you have not demonstrated a masterful focus, according to the rubric, on improving student outcomes until you have engaged with students. Like if they're not a part of the process, you have not completed your work. Uh, we are very explicit about that. Um, and you highlighted the two key uh, groups of students. Those are your current students, typically at the high school level, because uh, they have the most information about the full spectrum of services that you offer because they've experienced them. Um, uh, and then your recent graduates of trying to, and really what uh, boards are often listening for there is how do we do? Like when you left out of here, what did we do that had you already? In what areas did we really fall down? And we sent you out into the world and we told you were ready because we gave you a document that said you were ready. But in reality, you know, maybe maybe we you know deceived you or maybe we're self-deceived about the degree of readiness that you enjoyed when you left out of here. So those are great conversations to have. So, yes, you would include those. Uh, Juan, I, I saw you had your hand up. 
Yeah, I'm probably digging into the weeds here, uh, AJ. Yeah, that's, but, a, that's uh, what we're here for today. <laughs> um, in your experience, AJ, I'm just thinking about the community outreach uh, piece. Given that we're uh, elected by district versus some school boards that are um, uh, at large, um, are there any nuances to keying in on those districts that we we represent and we were elected by versus, as you uh, suggested, and I like the idea, going in to hear uh, from parents and stakeholders and students in a district where maybe I wouldn't uh, be as engaged uh, as a school board member, given that yeah. uh, I was elected by folks in, in my district. Yeah, so uh, we are super clear on this to the point where it angers some board members, but you're going to hear this over and over, so might as well start now. You are elected by a specific group uh, within the constituent, within your community. You are, however, your job is to serve every single child. Um, it is absolutely inappropriate for a board member to take the position, I serve this group of students and you serve that group of students. But unfortunately, because uh, that is how we show up in office, uh, that it's easy to unintentionally get into that mindset. It's easy to unintentionally kind of fall into that pattern. And so that's why you heard me be intentional about saying, no, we want to disrupt every part of that. Uh, we want, uh, like, I don't want um, only the black board members from my part of town looking out for black children. Like, that to me is absolutely reprehensible. I want every single one of you out uh, thinking that you personally are morally and legally accountable to all the little AJs running around out there, even if your skin is not as beautiful as mine. Uh, and, and so that's that is uh, that is a reality that we push and push and push for all board members. And so for that reason, that's why you heard me you know, allude to you can always go out in pairs and uh, as you're going out in pairs, actively try to go to parts of the community where you have not heard the pain, you know, the heart, the experience where you are less familiar with the vision and values of those members of the community. Um, and again, part of the intention there is you want every board member is on fire uh, for the needs of uh, your children as you are. And part of the way we accomplish that in this process is we force people out of their comfort zones to go do that listening. Uh, before I call you, Megan, uh, uh, Eric, uh, what questions or comments do you have so far? I don't know if we're gonna get to see you or not. Yeah, we will. I, I apologize. I'm getting my computer set up at the moment. Uh, with that <laughs> no said, I got a smile on my face as it sounds like I'm getting to go to Naples and somebody is going to King's Park. <laughs> yeah, th th this, is, this is a good plan. Uh, this is a really good plan. Uh, is uh, you, you really, you want the blessing of knowing what are the pain in parts of the communities that do not intersect with my normal everyday lived experience. Uh, that you will, you will feel blessed by it. You will feel exhausted by it because what I'm suggesting is a lot of work. But I, I assure you this, the board members who've gone through this, it's like at the end of it, this was a real blessing that I didn't even know I was missing in my life until I did. Uh, Megan, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you to clarify the rationale between going out two by two. Um, so the, the there, there are a couple of things here. One is it's actually helpful if you're gonna do teamwork to actually act like a team. Uh, <laughs> and so going out two by two accomplishes that. Um, there's also a trust factor. When we go out in twos, we have a lot more confidence and trust about that the, the fidelity of the message was maintained. Um, you know, uh, just to be really blunt about it, uh, my experience is that if we're not careful to, to disrupt the pattern, board members, when they are by themselves, are representing themselves. Board members, when they are in groups, are representing the school system. For this process, we do not need, this is not a campaign opportunity for you. Uh, we have zero interest in your ability to get reelected. We're not trying to help you look good. We're not trying to make your life more comfortable. We are trying to serve children as a team. Um, and so what we find is it is a lot easier to rely on board members to be focused on the work of the team and students as a whole when they are going out with a team member. When board members go out by themselves, it gets really easy. Uh, and I'll just uh, give an example from my own life. If I show up in, you know, my neighborhood, it's all, you know, my neighborhood in Kansas City where I was board chair, 98% African-American. I show up by myself and uh, there's going to be one type of conversation. I show up with one of my Latino colleagues from the other side of town. 
And it's going to be a slightly different type of conversation because some of the some of the things that people might might say if it's just me is like, hey, so what are we going to do to make sure that we get stuff for our kids? And the, and then there might be this divisive kind of energy going on, people trying to figure out how to you know peel off one board member and pit them against others. When you send folks out two by two, it actually winds up being a protective mechanism against a lot of that. And instead, it, it starts to elevate the conversation. Okay, I, I see you all go out together. So obviously, you all feel like the needs of that part of town and the needs of our part of town are intertwined. Yeah, yeah, we do. That's why that's why we're traveling together for this. This is not a campaign visit. This is a we're focused on student outcomes visit um, and, to, and to pull you all into that. Um, and so... Uh, that that is that is the reality of it. If you want to do teamwork well, our coaching is always going to be that you do it as a team, uh, not as individuals. Uh, Doug, what's, uh, something on your mind? I saw you come off of mute. I'm 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 fine. I'm, I'm good. Got it. Other questions, uh, comments. Uh, Diana hadn't heard much from you. Didn't know if you were, uh, you know, had something going on. Well. You know, you say that you want to take us out of our comfort zone, and I'm thinking of my myself and my fellow board members, and honestly, this has kind of been our wheelhouse, and this is nice. something that we're comfortable doing, so um, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm, Excellent. I'm thinking about my, I'm thinking about my fellow board members, and, and I am looking forward to going out to any other district besides my own with any other board member. And I think that's kind of the beauty of, of um, what we've been able to do as a board is to have that camaraderie and to have that shared vision. And I know that in the case of, um, you know, Megan and myself, being uh, PTA volunteers especially, we serve all children, and we don't make a distinct, uh, distinct distinction between, you know, kids that are from North Long Beach or the East Side or the West Side or anything. And we, what drives us is just that we are serving our children. So, yeah, and I'm and I'm pleased to hear that. You know, unfortunately, you know, again, Long Beach Board has has a long long history of kind of stability and of collaboration. Uh, that's just one of the things you all are known for in the council compared to other boards that shall be not named who are not in fact known for collaboration. They're known for anti-collaboration. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me uh, to hear uh, to hear that that's the case. Um, and so it won't be, you know, kind of a aberration from the norm for you all. All right. So if I'm not hearing any other questions, so what I want to do is actually then walk through the document, um, give you all a sense of, kind of what is the order of operations and we'll figure out where we need to make adjustments. Along the way, I'll be checking in with you all for specific feedback. There's some key decision points that are tucked into the document that only you all can answer. Uh, and so we'll, we'll keep coming back to those. Um, so uh, first, just orienting you to the document, uh, we use colors. Uh, gray means we haven't started the work yet. Um, you'll notice that most of the items on the far right column are shaded in gray, but this means we haven't started. Over, this is a living document. That's, there's a reason it's in Google. Uh, it's a living document. So as things happen, we will go through and check them off uh, individually. Uh, so um, for example, um, some of the things that have already occurred is we've already visited with board members and done a catch up session for new uh, board members. And so those all suddenly get coded as blue completed. Um, however, you know, if there are disruptions, some things might be red off track, yellow slightly off track, green. Uh, hopefully most things will be gray, green, or blue to indicate that they haven't been started, they've been started and they're on track or they've been fully completed. But there are due dates for every item on here. And so if we reach a point where there are things that are not getting done, then you'll see them indicated as you know, red and yellow to determine the to distinguish between the extent to which uh, the board has fallen behind uh, in critical work. Uh, today, we are in the process of talking about uh, our goals and guardrails development. Uh, we're actively, by doing this, talking about the goals and guardrails development process. Uh, and so at the end of our time together, I will um, re 
recode this one, um, the item labeled uh, 22821 board plans Golden Guard Rose development process. Right now, uh, I'll shade it in green because we're in the middle of having the conversation. At the end of our time together, I'll go back and shade it in blue and again, it's complete. Um, and so that is the, the status indicator system. Any question about those status indicators before we jump in here? Because uh, you'll be seeing those used a lot. Uh, so for example, the superintendent provides a draft uh, board handbook. I think you all had one in the past and uh, that was already was provided to us so we could see what you all had done previously. So that step is already completed. So I just indicated that as blue. Um, and then by the end of our time together today, Ideally, uh, you all will identify who's going to uh, work closely on revising that as well as who's going to work closely on revising the agendas. Um, and so we are in process of doing those things, uh, which means they'll be shaded in green. And then when we finish up at the end of the day, they'll be shaded in blue. So any questions about our you know, progress monitoring system for you all as a board? Uh, so the game plan here, don't get any yellows or reds. That's that's the official game plan. Any questions about that game plan? <laughs> uh, so I think we're good. So the, the, part of the reason I'm taking a moment to walk through this is because uh, the uh, the agreement that you've entered into says as long as the board does its job and we avoid um, getting off track on any items, then. Uh, then my time you know, um, and the overall services of the uh, council will come to you at no additional uh, charges. However, we start turning red. What this means is you all are not following through on what you said you would do on the timeline you said you would do it. And for that, we will start sending invoices uh, as a reflection, uh, one, of that you've stopped doing the things that you said you would do by when you would do them. Um, and as a reminder to honor your word. Uh, it's not your word to us that you violated in that moment. It's the word that you've given to your students uh, to represent the well that you violated in that moment. And that is the reason that we will send in voices uh, to reflect the time that we've invested. Um, however, if that never happens, and my suspicion is it won't, uh, then that's not something you'll have to worry about. Uh, but that is that is the a uh, game that we create with you just as a way of keeping score. Is the board honoring its work to the children it serves, um, not only in word, but also in deed? Uh, any questions about that? I guess, so there's somewhat gamification of good governance taking place here. All right, so uh, starting at the beginning, it says October, 2020, we already did that. November, we already did that. February, all of that stuff were on uh, Tap to have completed by the end of this conversation, and that takes us, um, uh, and that takes us into March. So what we'll do, so going through this document and the board signing off on it and making the necessary adjustments, that is what we are referring to as the board plans, the goal and guardrail development process. You all also do have an existing handbook, but it just needs some love. It's missing, frankly, a lot. Um, and so we're going to recommend that you fill it in from what we can tell from having uh, tried to do a little bit of investigating on this matter is that a lot of things seem to have been done just really informally uh, uh, throughout the history of Long Beach. Um, and there's some benefit to that, but there's some, also some real cost to that. So especially since you have a new board and a new superintendent, our recommendation um, is that you all actually codify your core processes as a governing body. Um, and just have it clear, this is this is how we do what we do as a team. And then over time, if you all feel like that's not necessary, then you are welcome to scale back from it. Uh, but that's why you see um, work related to your handbook that really describes how you all operate as a team. This, this handbook is nothing about the superintendent or the administration. This is purely your handbook for how you as a team function as a team. Um, and our recommendation to you as a new group um, is to not... Uh, leave that up to informality, but to really formalize that, put it in writing, uh, get used to it. And then once you've gotten really good at it, if you all decide you don't need it anymore, uh, then set it aside. Um, or if you feel like it's useful, then keep it. Uh, so that's why you see the draft uh, handbook revision process in here. Uh, questions about that part? Yeah, Juan? Yeah, AJ, and, and obviously we committed to uh, putting time and energy uh, and effort 
uh, into this. Um, is this an area where, as an example, um, we could have a standing item on our agenda to get some of this work done as a part of our board meetings, or do you find it better and more strategic to um, add additional special meetings such as today uh, to do this work? Uh, you all are a pretty lean board. Uh, to put this, put this in perspective, another board that we're working with right now, they average 14 board meetings a month. Um, and so our coaching to them, I'm assuming you all don't meet 14 times a month. So our coaching to them is actually to repurpose 12 of those 14 meetings to do this work. Uh, you all are in the blessed position of not meeting 14 times a month because you actually enjoy being effective. Uh, and so for you, we may actually have to add in some um, extra time. As much as possible, if we can get pre-work done with a subset of the board, you know, just a couple of you get some pre-work done so that when it does come to the board that you can manage it within your existing meeting structure, we, we want to do that. But from time to time, as you'll see in here, there'll be some times we'll need to actually add an additional date to the calendar. But we really want to lean into doing it, having a, two board members uh, do as much pre-work or us interviewing you all and then bringing you pre-work um, and then going from that j for no other reason, just to save you all time. If for some reason that doesn't work for you all and you all prefer to do board of the whole, you know, from the very beginning, um, from a blank sheet of paper, we'll do that with you. But generally, most boards don't want to start with a blank sheet of paper at a board meeting. You want to start with something to react to at a board meeting, tweak it from there, adopt it, and then move on, um, which you can then accomplish in 15 minutes as opposed to the three hours it takes to develop. Um, and so that's what we'll lean into. Um, so today, in that regard, today is a bit of an uh, aberrant, uh, but there will need to be some days like this. But hopefully you all will authorize breaking the work into smaller bites for small groups to work on and then bring something back for the board to re respond to a uh, meeting of the whole. Other questions, comments about this handbook part, uh, really thinking about what are the board's processes and practices and how do we codify those so that we all know, you know, we're all working from the same uh, set of expectations. Any other questions about that as an item? This came up in the when we met with all of you together, uh, but it also came up in your individual conversations. Just um, there just seemed to be this undercurrent of uncertainty around wh what are the norms and how do we conduct business and what do we say is appropriate and inappropriate. Um, one specific example I'll, I'll lift up that really does need to be addressed uh, in your manual is what is the appropriate uh, relationship. Uh, between uh, board and district staff. Uh, how, how do you, um, so I, I suspect all of having visited with each of you, I suspect each of you understand that you are actually not the supervisors for principals, for example, uh, that they don't report to you. They don't have to do anything you say. They don't actually work for you. Um, they work for the superintendent. I, I, uh, from individual conversations, I get the sense that you all are clear on that. I think what's less clear, because there's wild variation between the five of you, <laughs> wild variation. I think what's less clear is what is the relationship between you all um, and principals? Um, that's not for me to say. It really is for you all to say, as a board, to say, here is what the nature of the relationship looks like between board members and district staff who don't report to us. That's entirely distinct from the relationship between board members and district staff who do report to you. Like that, that, that is a entirely different type of relationship. But instead of just living with the current status quo, which is everybody does wildly divergent things in this area, what we've heard is that it would make more sense for you all to just simply have that conversation, put some ideas on paper, and then the board eventually say, you know, it's going to be this, it's going to be this, or, or whatever the parameters are. So that's one example of where you all just need to reach a consensus for yourself on what are the things that we want to codify and then what is what is the, and then what does that actually look like um, and so when you see that handbook it's going to be a whole variety of issues but that's just one example uh, other questions or comments about this idea of the handbook uh, is there any discomfort with having two board members work with Monica and I on putting together a rough draft that then comes back to the board for you all to then consider and edit from that point uh, before ultimately adopting. Is there any discomfort with that idea? Okay. Are there any vic <clears throat> volunteers willing to serve in said capacity? Anybody super excited about 
the fine art of writing operating procedure, uh, a 20, 30 pages of operating procedures. Anybody, anybody, any takers? Um, any takers? All right, I saw uh, Megan and Wong. Uh, anybody have a problem with those being your two representatives working with Monica and I on this? So what will happen is we'll work with those two, um, you know, uh, and you know, Monica and I, we do this all the time. So th this will be a pretty quick process. Um, but basically it'll be you all telling us, here's the, here's the area that we have a question about. And then we'll pitch you a bunch of different examples of how it's done all over the country. You all pick the one that makes the most sense for Long Beach in your estimation, and you'll put it down. When you come back to the board, it'll be you two saying, hey, here is a draft document. Uh, what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be tweaked, um, because you'll have worked with us through that. If somebody says they don't like something, you could say, well, there are these three other ways that we could have picked. Uh, does one of those make more sense? You'll make the proper swap outs, and then ultimately you'll vote on it and be done. So that's what that process will look like. Um, Juan and Megan's job is not to decide what your procedures will be for you. Their job is just to give, create a document for the board as a whole to respond to. Um, so we've got that sorted out. The next big item um, is uh, the agenda uh, revision. Uh, for this, uh, we'll also need uh, a couple board members uh, to work on this. Um, but ultimately what we'll wind up doing before it's complete is we will need to take over a small piece of a future board meeting uh, to just walk you all through an evaluation of your current agendas um, so that all of you can have a chance to lift up what are the things that we think work, what are the things we think don't work. But there is some pre-work for that as well. Um, and so um, if there's comfort with doing so, are there, are there a couple board members who uh, have a lot of um, energy around um, helping bring a a uh, rough draft proposal back to the board regarding what uh, changes you might make to how your agendas are structured. And there are a couple board members interested in that. So Juan and Doug, uh, anybody have a problem with those two kind of being your ambassadors on this? All right, excellent. Uh, then uh, we will get that party started. Um, and again, nothing gets decided until it comes back to the board, but these are the folks who will, you know, help put ideas together on your behalf. Uh, so that's uh, all of February. Um, and so then in March, uh, just, to, just to explain that first line in March, it talks about self-eval. Basically what this means is you all need a way of knowing, are we getting more effective at the things that we said we would do? And so next month, what we'll want to do is uh, set a baseline. So we'll pull out the board self-evaluation tool and you all will self-evaluate. We'll do this live at a board meeting. Uh, so carve us out. Uh, you know, maybe half an hour um, less if you all read the instrument and are really, really clear on it before we start. More if we have to spend a lot of time going through the instrument at the board meeting. We recommend the less approach, but it does mean that you all have done your homework. Um, and so if you all have done your homework, it goes really quickly because uh, it's basically just six pages. And the only question is where are we at? Which of these four columns represents our current performance on each of these six pages? Like this is not a tedious activity. Um, and so if you've already ferreted that out for yourself before the board meetings, then it goes very quickly. Um, but if we have to stop and work through it in advance, um, then that's no problem. Uh, but that's what that's about. The intention then is that happens every quarter, every three months uh, during this process, really for the next about year, year and a half, every three months, we'll pull this agent self-evaluation out and we'll see how you score. It, the rubric scores you between zero and 100 points. So we'll set a baseline score next month and we'll figure out where are we starting. And then over time, the question is, uh, are we getting, are we scoring more and more points on the rubric or are we not? Uh, are we getting more and more focused on student outcomes or have we kind of stalled out or are we declining? Juan? Yeah, uh, AJ, you answered it. I was just gonna ask, will, will you share with us, uh, since we did go through at least part part of this. Actually, yeah. I think we went through the whole thing in November. Will we yeah. start off kind of with a reflection on where, where we thought we were in November? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's a, it's an easy reflection. You didn't think you were anywhere in November. Right. <laughs> uh, so so the good news is, it's only going up from here. There's only improvement from here. It's it's going to be great. <laughs> uh, so that's the uh, board self evaluation. Again, the intention is to do that quarterly as a way of the board holding itself accountable. Um, also, um, and we'll get to it later, but just uh, since we're in the topic, it 
the best practice is always to self-evaluate immediately before doing your annual evaluation of your employees. So before I have a conversation about if my employee has done her job for the year, I should probably first stop and reflect on have I done my job for the year? And then after I've reflected on my own performance, then evaluate um, my employee. And so you'll see that same thing uh, below is that first you'll see a board annual self-evaluation and then following that you'll see a board's annual superintendent evaluation. And, and that's why is so that you are evaluating your employee uh, with clarity in your own mind about your own performance. Imagine if all of your bosses behave that way. How might that modify how some of these evaluations have gone in the past? Um, and so that's what you will do. Um, then the next item gets to what we started off talking about, which is the community uh, you know, listening work. Um, and so we'll actually provide a training on that um, as much or as little as you all feel like you need. But we'll put together a script for you and then provide that script. And then we'll actually uh, role play uh, going through the script. Um, in some places, they actually asked Monica and I to lead the first session um, just so uh, we can demonstrate what that looks like. But a lot of places, especially if you have a history of community listening, like it sounds like you all do, uh, probably won't need us to do that. You can just jump in, but we'll schedule a little bit of time if you all feel like you need to actually go through that and role play it so that you feel very comfortable and ready. And then at that point, uh, the board will actually start conducting its listening sessions. So this is the part where we reach a key decision point. Okay, and so before I get into the decision point, Diana? Yes. Um, how do we determine uh, what, what outreach we will be conducting as far as uh, do we make a list of, of what Oh, that's exactly what we're going into. That is a decision point. Uh, so congratulations, stop being precocious. Uh, so what we have to do now is we have to think through what are the key things that, uh, the what are the key uh, constituencies that have to be um, engaged um, that you're gonna to invite to your meetings? Um, that's one list. And then a separate list from that um, is what are uh, the key communities or elements of the community that even if we host it, they're probably not gonna show up. Um, and so that we're gonna to have to go to them. Um, and so I wanna start a brainstorm and gener generate those two lists right now. This is, this is not your final opportunity. This is just getting you thinking about this. We'll actually assign homework as one of the next steps is for you to uh, start uh, tallying these up uh, in a spreadsheet. And then um, in another week, we'll actually take that full spreadsheet of here are all the ideas that people have offered. And, um, and now uh, you need to start signing up for them. And so we'll, you know, put it all, organize it out for you. And then you need to go into the spreadsheet and say, okay, uh, I'm willing to go to this, these eight or these three, or the, I'm willing to co-lead. And whichever ones get two people willing to co-lead, then great, that one's going to happen. Whichever ones don't get two people willing to co-lead, then that one's not going to happen. So again, this is really how much outreach and how much engagement happens will be dictated by how much work you all are willing to do um, and kind of how urgently you feel like uh, it needs to take place. If you're not willing to prioritize it, then that is the signal that um, we've reached uh, a sufficient quantity. Um, also, this is a great time. Uh, what happens in some cases, people are like, hey, these three constituencies are really important to me. However, I'd like to go to ones that I don't already know. And then maybe you all say, hey, will you go to these three that are in my community and I'll go to three in your community so I can learn about over there, you can learn about here. That's a perfectly normal part of this process. That's perfectly healthy and normal part of the process. And so just understand that it, it, it'll take a little bit to sort it out. There's a little matchmaking involved here, but the process works. You just have to trust the process. So the first decision point and again, we're not going to create an exhaustive list. This is just to get you thinking. When you contemplate engagement, so this is these are meetings that we're going to host. And we're going to invite people to come to us. Um, as you contemplate engagement, who, what are examples of groups that really need to be engaged? That you're going to host a uh, you're going to host a listening session, and they're going to uh, and they're going to come to it. Where's the, what are examples of some groups? Um, I can. Sorry, go ahead, 
Oh, <laughs> um, I think uh, right off the top of my head, uh, PTA. Um, we have a CAC group that's uh, parents of um, our special ed kids. We have district like um, DLAC, DCAC. Um, uh, anyhow, I'll I'll turn that over. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I was just going to suggest uh, AJ that Dr. Baker and staff have already a, a, a list of ongoing district meetings that we just uh, agree as a board today and say all of the pre-existing groups that we're already meeting with as a district, we would invite specifically uh, for that and then spend some time and energy maybe identifying groups that aren't in these spaces that we already meet with. Yeah. So there's, our, so there's a bunch of groups and just say by default, all the groups that we normally communicate with, we're gonna, we're gonna add them on the list and then we just have to fill in the gaps of who who does that miss? Got it. Uh, other thoughts? People no, I think, I think Juan hit it on the nose. So Juan hit it. Um, I, I, I would say in addition, the um, community college and the state university. Uh, so reach out to our higher ed partners um, and, and do an engagement session with them uh, with key leadership there. In the past for the superintendent search, we did district specific. So those those areas that are represented that we're elected to and obviously wouldn't necessarily go to our own, but specifically those groupings of schools, uh, one per at least one per each of those. One per district or one per school? Per, my, I, my suggestion was one per district. Um, and then another thought is to do- uh, We have a school, lot of schools. We do. <laughs> uh, is to do uh, grade level specific meetings. So a TK through, through five, a middle and K-8, and a high school group of those three potentially so that we're capturing parents with students at similar ages. Any other thoughts about engagement sessions where you will invite people to come to you? All right, how about outreach sessions? What are examples of groups that you would wanna to go to them? That they're unlikely, even if you extend the invitation directly, they're unlikely to come to you, but they're still critical to be listened to. And so you're gonna to have to find a way to go to them. And where is that place that you're gonna go? What are examples? It's, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine those spaces when we're talking about COVID-19 and all of the public spaces that have been restricted. But one of the locations that I was thinking of that often, at least in the city of Long Beach, has a fairly large black and brown constituency is like the MLK Parade. I know that it happens once a year, but it does have fairly large presentation uh, representation of uh, the black and brown community, predominantly African-Americans. And um, though it is like a carnival style setting, there is a lot of uh, school aged children that are there along with uh, parents as well. I would add that we also have very vibrant um, organizations and associations at the neighborhood level. Uh, that already have standing uh, meetings. Many of them already have standing meetings. So there's a whole set. Maybe we can ask um, our, our friends at the city to share with us any ongoing standing, either neighborhood meetings or association meetings that they're aware of that they would share a list with us. Um, in addition to that, uh, I think Doug alluded to, uh, right, that we have a lot of churches, synagogues, congregations, that are already meeting um, and or having events uh, as, as the one that Eric described. Uh, so tapping into our ministry uh, networks uh, and the like. And then I think lastly, and not in order of priority or, or, or sequence, um, we have a lot of cultural organizations and or CBOs that are working with very specific um, diverse groups in our community. Uh, so I think if we spent some time uh, just identifying and, and, and if we want to do a brainstorm session just on that, 
I'm happy to participate and or help co-facilitate that. There's a lot of grassroots organizations in Long Beach that um, are not particip participating in any of the first two spaces uh, that I mentioned, uh, but that do have maybe not um, as consistent ongoing meetings, but they're certainly gathering, networking, and in some cases organizing. Uh, and so, you know, I can think of like the Filipino Migrant Center, um, you know, a lot of Cambodian uh, organizations and associations. Um, um, the Long Beach Immigrant Rights Coalition, by its name, meets with other smaller organizations that are doing immigrant rights advocacy. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure that with the, with the knowledge that we have here uh, on our board, we can identify maybe not necessarily each of those organizations, but what networks uh, there are that are already existing that would give us access to meeting times, events, activities that are coming up uh, that we could attend. Yeah, and I would add in groups like the center um, that reach folks all over the city, as well as groups like CCE Day who that are doing specific work um, around values and restorative justice. And they bring together uh, both students and parents and asking to be a part of, like you said, to, to ask for some time on their agenda on normal meetings that they have, as well as some of our, or, or all of our city council members who hold regular uh, meetings for their district. I know some of them have Zoom meetings once a month or once a quarter, again, asking for some time on an agenda uh, for a population that may not have school age kids. Yeah, I would also add to these um, <clears throat> Central Cha, the um, Kumai Girls in Action, um, uh, Kumai um, Parent Association. We, I'm, I'm glad Juan that you brought up our, our cultural leaders uh, because they're always involved in what we do as a district. So it'd be very nice to include them as well. I wonder about business leaders too, in terms of like, I know that <clears throat> there's a downtown business association and a number of very locally oriented business groups that I think would be interesting to engage in this process as well. They employ many of our graduates after they, you know, uh, when they leave Long Beach Unified, many of them host our students as interns in the community. And so it, it would be interesting to incorporate them in some way as well. There are four or five business associations throughout the city. And of course the mothership is uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And we have to be sure to include the city leadership of Lakewood, Signal Hill, and Catalina. We have to make sure that we're very inclusive. Mm -hmm. We're not just Long Beach. <laughs> AJ, yeah. um, it's 2.25, so I'm wondering just about a bio break, as we often call it, even for six minutes, if that might, if this is a good point to, to do that, or just please think about that in the next few minutes. No, let's um, let's um, do so. Any other reflections on this list, um, either engagement or outreach? Uh, yeah, any other brainstorming? We have in Long Beach a, a pretty important organization that uh, provides support and resources and leadership development for nonprofit organizations called the Long Beach Nonprofit Partnership. Uh, so they have an extensive database, not just for Long Beach, but we, we should uh, also think about, um, you know, those areas of the city that we, that are a part of our district, right? Lakewood, uh, Signal Hill, uh, organizations in those, you know, Avalon. Um, so, um, I think just asking the nonprofit partnership if they can put a list together uh, and that way we could just cross check to see if we're missing any uh, key organizations that they're that are yeah. part of their network. Yeah. And one of the things that you brought up AJ earlier, which in all honesty aligns with some of my early uh, passions that I spoke to is that when we're talking about outreach, a lot of the 
places that we've suggested are because they have an active group of people which is fantastic that's great i love the fact that there are people attached to uh their neighborhood associations and people attached to their congregations and things of that nature but the students that are falling between the cracks often have family members that aren't attached to those uh type of industries or organizations and so i know that you spoke to uh the potential of knocking on doors in regards to um, gaining some form of connectivity to those that aren't attached to those different uh, types of organizations. And so I just want to also make sure that I add that to the room where I do want to get creative in regards to how do we connect to those families that, especially in the midst of um this pandemic aren't going to be connected to congregations, aren't going to be connected to neighborhood associations, aren't going to Zoom meetings, uh, and are unfortunately also the mothers and fathers of students who are underperforming in our district. Do you have any, any particular ideas that come to mind? That's the reason why I posed it to the room, because I don't have one. And I'm hoping that we can get creative as a team. So yeah, my, I, norm, my normal game plan on these things is door knocking. But like I said, I'm not comfortable recommending that. Other, other, yeah. But maybe that's right for you all, and I'm just being overcautious. One. One of yeah. the things that that and that's been shared with with some of the community stakeholder meetings that I've had. Um, just maybe not door knocking, AJ, but uh, old school calling, cold calling, texting, um, and I think the hubs um, that we have right now are sort of two. Um, and, and I think we, we, we may consider just old school flyers and, and putting signage at our schools because a lot of those community members, Eric, I agree with you 100%, are still using public transportation, still walking back and forth. So I think putting, you know, in, investing a little time and energy and for those schools that have marquees or using, you know, old school banners, um, you know, flyer distribution, uh, because I have had heard from community members, especially for the food distribution networks uh, that we can tap into right now, that you know hard copy flyers uh, are working in those communities. And so, even though there may be parents that aren't formally associated with those grassroots organizations, that we can call on those organizations to uh, do some of that footwork, uh, right? So, a, a lot of the community members that I've talked to are actually asking. Hey, is there a way that we can do, um, you know, flyer distribution at a neighborhood market, uh, for instance, and or uh, in parking lots of our school uh, district where there are already some events and activities going on? Okay. Uh, and not in lieu of, I, I like the door knocking, Eric, but maybe we do a phone bank, uh, right? Or and 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 do the, you know a, a, an outreach at least with leading messages uh, with folks. Yeah. And I apologize for throwing out a problem of not having the solution. I hate being that guy, <laughs> but I do want to make sure that that voice was in the room because when I once again attach my personal story to the situation, uh, in all honesty, if we did this 35 years ago, the district would have missed my parents. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, wanted to make sure that I threw that out there. Yeah. And, and again, you all, I'm, I could be that I'm being overly cautious. Like if, you know, in my community, we we knock doors to accomplish this issue, um, and it could be if if you all feel like door knocking is right for you at this time, you know, as board members, uh, then I say, you know, knock on, um, and I'll, I'll I'll wear out a pair of shoes knocking with you. I got no problem with knocking on doors, um, but I just know that a lot of communities are going to be particularly sensitive to that right now, um, and so that's 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 why I uh, flag that as probably not something that I'm comfortable recommending. Uh, any other reflections before we uh, before we transition? Other reflection on this before we transition? Yeah, one. One last thought. Uh, I'm, I'm very conscientious, uh, Eric. I'm trying to sort of think outside the box here. We just came off of um, census outreach strategy, mm -hmm. all yeah. right? Let, let's follow up with the team uh, that was part of that. We had a census committee uh, here in the city uh, whose primary purpose was to reach hard to reach communities, uh, uh, right? So may, maybe uh, just following up with them uh, because they had already identified neighborhoods that were hard to count and uh, they did canvassing, right? Not necessarily door knocking, but canvassing. So I think we can build on the network that we just came out of through this long census effort 
uh, to reach some of those hard to count, hard to reach households? Well, it could be at the end of all things. Uh, you all asked for a very spe uh, demographically specific uh, set of, you know, 100 phone numbers each that each of the five of you is going to call. It's like, you know, these 500 families are demographically um, representative, but also folks that we have no other real way of connecting with. We're going to give 100 to each of the five of you. You're going to call those folks, you know, have a little Google form that you can fill out of what you heard when you talk to them and kind of that connection. And then that will be kind of our representative sample of families that we weren't able to reach that ordinarily we might go knock on their door, but that we couldn't do this time around. I mean, so, you know, ideas like that, I think are spot on. I, I, I love it. Not as much as I love door knocking, but I, I think you're right. That, that, that could be a great uh, way of trying to meet that need. Um, and I'm sure if we asked your superintendent, you know, she, you know, they could, they could figure out, you know, what is a, a, the appropriate sampling uh, that would need to be uh, reached uh, that be, need to be used in order to reach, you know, the folks that you normally don't reach. Uh, yeah, I think it, before we yeah, I yeah, think it's Eric. a good. I think it's a good tactic, and um, I'm being a little facetious here. We're all uh, in this space of, uh, of elected officials, and we're not too uh, far removed from call time, so it'll be right. Yeah, <laughs> everybody's right. favorite time, <laughs> man. But anyway, keep, keep that skill I did, sharp. Right. <laughs> I, I I just yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, so that completes our brainstorm. And again, this won't be your last. What happens, we'll create a spreadsheet. These will be in it. What we'll ask is that you all fill in the spreadsheet and then I'll send them in and then we'll create a, a spreadsheet that has all of the different brainstorming in it. And then, you know, we'll just kind of iterate from there uh, to try to build out um, of who all needs to be communicated with. Then once that's built out and you know, on one major spreadsheet, then we'll send it back out to you individually and say, okay, now fill in which ones are you willing to sign up for, you know, go to it, and we'll just iterate through it. Um, so with that, let's take a break uh, before we dive back into uh, the rest of our timeline. Um, uh, let's see, would, uh, would an eight minute stretch break work for folks? Do you need longer than that? Uh, then let's come back uh, at, um, let's, then let's come back at 41 after. Now, here's the thing. Um, when I say let's come back at 41 after, my, my request is that we come back at 41 after exactly like when the clock strikes 41, that that's when we're back. Um, so I just want to clarify what I mean by that. So uh, does coming back at 41 after work for folks? All right. Yes. See you at 41 after.
the next steps are, as I indicated, we'll get spreadsheets out and we'll get things going and, and then we'll compile it all and then you'll see where we're at. Um, because we don't know what you all want the uh, community listening work to look like, both on the engagement on the outreach side, <clears throat> all of the remaining dates are a little bit speculative and will be speculative, you know, really for the next uh, 14 days while we go through the process of figuring out what your community listening uh, work will look like. <clears throat> uh, but once we've got that spreadsheet back from you, then we'll have a defined set and then we can do a revision of this that will you know, push everything back the appropriate number of days. If it needs to push it back seven days, 30 days, whatever it is that you all's call. Uh, but we will adjust back every single date on here uh, to be responsive to whatever length of time uh, you all determine is needed for that listening. So, so don't be too worried about the dates on here. Think of them more uh, as, you know, the increment between various dates is what to be focused on. And most of these don't have a firm date yet. They're really looking at in which months do they need to occur. And so we'll add more specificity once we have that answered from you all. Um, so the rest of the agenda, the rest of the timeline basically kind of sorts itself out. So we'll go through it um, but so that if you have major questions, we can be responsive to those. But most of it now should make sense in the context of this. So for the rest of March, um, it's just going through the process of trying to get a, a revised version of the handbook and get that back to the full board. Um, and then uh, to consider uh, that um, in April. So in that you're gonna see that as a normal thing is we recommend you think about something at one meeting and then you act on it at a separate meeting. Uh, we pretty much never going to recommend that you think about something and act on it at the same meeting. Like we really want to separate those two out. So just so you can do the best, be the best version of yourselves. It's just good practice. And we'd encourage you to kind of take that approach on really substantive, non kind of routine matters uh, as a board for really routine matter. Like I don't think you need to contemplate the toilet paper contract at one meeting and then vote on it in a separate meeting. Like that's a routine thing. You could probably do that all at once. But for things that are more substantive, generally encourage you contemplate it once at one meeting and act at a separate one. And so you're going to see that here. Um, what you'll notice uh, there toward the end of March is the super, at that point, the superintendent is providing the board with data. So remember I said uh, in response to Doug's question that there are two key sources of information you're going to rely on, student data and community uh, feedback. Uh, well, that is the uh, area where the uh, student data comes in. And so that's what that's referring to is you really want your superintendent to do an analysis of the student performance um, and give you the results of that analysis. Um, so that's why that's describing you to have that by the end of March. Um, and then you use that plus the input you got from the community to make decisions about uh, what, what really are the highest vision and values that we need to calcify into a set of goals and guardrails. Um, it's also at that time by the end of next month that the committee uh, comes back and shares uh, that Juan and Megan come back at the end of next month and share about the handbook. Juan and Doug come back at the end of next month and share uh, about agenda, uh, potential agenda revisions. Uh, that leads us into April. At this point, uh, we, we would need to have an extended work session. This is not something that will work well with your existing meetings. Uh, so far, we haven't really added meetings to the to the list. These are all other things that you can do as a regular course of your board meetings, with the exception of the engagements. Those are going to be uh, community meetings that you host. But in terms of board meetings, we haven't added any. But this one that at the beginning of April, that would need to be added to uh, the list as a full time set aside, just because it normally takes a fair amount of time to synthesize that uh, one. Yeah, AJ, and actually it's my just thoughts. I'd like to hear some thoughts from Dr. Baker as well. We have a pretty packed March. Um, we we um, have scheduled, you may be aware of this, AJ, two additional days of board workshop uh, in the middle of March. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, um, of course, we have our reopening of schools that third week of March um, moving forward. Um, just wondering... Uh, Jill, uh, on thoughts or if it's too soon for that two-day two -day board workshop uh, in March. And, you know, since we have so much stuff going on, uh, right, at, at what point we sort of think through what March looks like for us, and then if it's necessary, what we may have to push back to April. 
Yeah, no, thanks for asking, Dr. Nunez. Um, we are planning for the board workshop in March, um, and I see it as an opportunity, especially for the data report to come to you for discussion. Um, I think what we'll, we'll need to do is, um, you know, typically you have the entire senior staff there for the board workshop. Um, they'll just need permission from you all and from me to not be there the entire time as they're ready to reopen schools. They'll come and go as, as needed. Um, but I think we're prepared to offer a, a data analysis set and also for the opportunity for, the, for you to look at it with different eyes and then request whatever else you don't see in it that first round that perhaps could be that brought back in April. So that's kind of my thinking at this point. And but you know we're open to if you if you think that there's a different timeline that you want to work with. That sounds great. Just to want, wanted for us to be mindful of that. Okay. Thanks. Well, and the other thing to remember it depends on how much community listening you all do. If you all are still in the middle of community listening. Um, yeah, at the middle or end of April, then that means these items that currently say April don't really happen until May. And so it really depends on how much listening you all schedule um, the, of where these things actually wind up. Uh, one other thing I, I meant to mention earlier, um, again, this goes back to Doug's question. I said there are two sources of information. There's the student data uh, that's a one to three page summary you know, analysis from superintendent and community listening. Uh, that's a one to three page summary document. So really you wind up with these two documents that between the two of them are somewhere between two and six pages long, usually like five or less pages. Eventually somebody's gonna ask you, why did you pick this instead of this? And what you wanna always be able to go back to is, let me show you this five page document that has student data and community feedback in it. Um, this is the document where, this is the, information we were listening to um, that helped us reach that conclusion. And then at that moment, you'll be able to tell them, here's how we arrived at this document with student data. Here's how we arrived at this document with community listening. You'll be able to lay out the whole process. You don't ever want people to ask, hey, where do these goals come from? It's like, Facebook? Like you really want to be able to be really clear with folks around where this stuff came from. And so that's one of the reasons it's going to be really valuable to you to have these two documents, a synopsis, one to three pages, of the data, a synopsis, one or three pages about the community uh, feedback, and always be able to pull that out and say, here's here's the kind of this core source data that we relied on in making these decisions. Um, ideally, uh, again, uh, don't worry about the dates, but ideally the next steps in the process are the board will adopt your revised handbook. Um, so you'll spend you know a month and a half from now, uh, Two months from now, the board revised, adopts a revised handbook and a revised uh, board agenda. This board agenda, by the way, is no joke. Um, in order to spend the predominant amount of your time actually evaluating whether students are learning, that means you're going to have to figure out how to become more economical in your use of time because the answer isn't double the length of how much we meet each month. The answer is some of the things we're doing, we're going to have to figure out how to do them differently to you know go from spending some we're spending 40 minutes on, can we get that done in 10 minutes? Can we get it done in zero minutes? Like, is it actually possible to get the work of that item done, spending zero minutes during a board meeting, but maybe, you know, maybe it becomes an email or a video message or something else. And so just understand that uh, that conversation is going to be, will be very uncomfortable for folks. So when you finally do come around to then adopting a revised board agenda, uh, you're going to want to be prepared to explain to anybody who asks you why, wait a minute, you all, this is not the way you've always done things. Why are you changing? I like the way you're doing things. You're going to have to be prepared to explain to them. AJ, can you give a tangible example of that, that you've got in mind where prior to this kind of work, a board was doing this in the board meeting and then they handled it another way? Yeah, yeah probably the most common example. Like this happens just nonstop. Uh, is boards will, so there's a lot of boards, they'll have a meeting and the purpose of that meeting is to review the agenda or I'm, I'm thinking of one board I'm working right now. They have three meetings. Uh, yeah, one meeting is to set the agenda and that's the full board. One meeting is to uh, review the agenda items uh, now that they've got them and that's with the full board. And then the next meeting, uh, they literally meet three Mondays in a row to set the agenda uh, review the board items and then vote on the board items. <clears throat> um, and all of them hate life because this is a horrible plan. 
uh, but nobody could figure out how to get out of it. And so we worked with them to design, okay, what are the benefits you're getting out of the current process? Because we want to come up with a system that retains the current benefits without the current costs. Because the current cost is three Mondays in a row, every single month, you all are in the meeting and you can't stand each other the more you spend time together. Uh, so that's the cost. So how can we economize? And so uh, the board I'm thinking of, the system that it looks like we're leaning toward um, is there, um, and, and other boards have done the same system. That's that's why it comes so easily to mind when you ask. The system that they're leaning toward is they'd actually cut out two of those meetings entirely. Like two of those, you know, the set the agenda meeting would go away. The review all the agenda item meetings would go away. And they just have the meeting the third Monday of the month to actually vote. But in order to do that, the benefit of having those other meetings, there's a lot more transparency. There's a lot of transparency when you do it that way. Nobody can deny that. I mean, it's no, it, it doesn't actually want it being transparent because nobody's watching all three meetings, but it does create the opportunity, the, you know, the, the visage of transparency because everything is, you know, visible. So we had to figure out how do we maintain transparency without having all these meetings. So what they're uh, moving toward doing is uh, they will get their agenda packet 14 days before the So they get the agenda packet 14 days before the meeting. So they actually still get their information uh, as far in advance as they, you know, are actually seven days earlier than they used to. So it used to be they got seven days before they voted on it. Now they'll actually get it 14 days before it. So that's one step. And then what they'll do is they'll have a period of time where they can submit questions to the superintendent about the items. And then there's a period of time where the superintendent collects all the questions and then um, and then takes all those questions and answers all of them in writing and then attaches that written Q&A document to the actual agenda. So now it is a public document Everybody can see all the questions. Everybody can see all the answers. But you cut out two meetings. They got the same benefit that they got from those two meetings without spending time in two meetings. And now it's all just a kind of an email process that results in a public document that is uh, that retains the transparency without spending the time. So that is one tangible example uh, of what one board did to go from three meetings down to one meeting with retaining the transparency, but still getting access to all the questions that they wanted asked. Um, they're still, you know, being able to be as rigorous about the oversight. Uh, is that, Jill, is that responsive to your inquiry? Is it, anybody have questions about that? Is, does that make sense, what, what I just described there? Yeah, um, so it's things like that. And, and they could have done that at any time in the last five years, like all of the, horribleness of their current structure, it could have changed at any time, but they just couldn't figure out how to get out of it themselves. And so going through a process like this, we can sit down and really help people figure out how do we, uh, how do we create something new? Other question. So, um, so that's a lot of what the agenda redesign looks like. And um, so now that now that they know what they're getting into, Doug and Juan are probably like, why did we sign up for this again? Um, so then after we go through all that. Can you take me off of the <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there's gonna be so much work involved. Maybe that sounds like a Diana job, really, when you get down to it. Let's, let's put the let's put Diana on it. Um, so after that, um, one of the other things that you see on here is it shows up as self-evaluation. There are two items. Get used to seeing these. I, I promised you every quarter you do a self-evaluation. What I didn't mention is that right before you do that, you do a time use evaluation. And what it does is you actually take up all the minutes that you spent in a month and you uh, and we have a little time use evaluation form that we'll just fill out there live in the board meeting. And it goes really quickly. Um, the first time it takes a little while, but after that, it goes really fast. Uh, you just say, okay. Great. How did how did we spend our time? We right now the the intention that you all have articulated is we want to try to spend at least half of our time each month. So the first question is how many minutes do we spend each month? Is it a hundred minutes a month? Is it five hundred? Is it a thousand? Is it fifteen hundred minutes a month? Like how many minutes a month are we spending meeting? And then the question is are we investing at least half of whatever that number is into monitoring student progress? And so this quarterly time use evaluation 
is uh, so each quarterly evaluation, we'll do a time use evaluation of the previous month to figure out how did you spend your time? Did you spend it the way that you said you wanted to spend it? And so that's what that's about. Yes, Megan. Just on that note, um, something I know when we did this earlier was, um, would it be possible for our board secretary, and I guess this is a question for Dr. Baker, to time stamp our agenda in terms of what time the items start? Because we know that public comment fluctuates quite a bit, especially during COVID. Sometimes it's extended, sometimes it's not. So if we have a 240 minute meeting or 180 minute meeting, it'd be helpful for us as we try and do this work to be really aware of what the time stands were on the agenda item numbers. So that's just a request maybe to save some time later. Absolutely. I think that'd be really simple to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. The, 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 you got to watch it though. I think that there's a, a downside to the public if it's, I mean, maybe maybe what you're suggesting is it's only to us and that's how, what we anticipate the item will take. But uh, if you make it public or it becomes public in some way, people will think, oh, you know, I'm only getting this much time or I, I'm, I'm just worried about perceptions. Right. Are I think you, I was I was referring to to the minutes after the, minutes, the meeting, not the agenda, not the agenda. So that we start public comment at 715. We ended it at 802 um, is how it would read in the minutes. So we would have kind of an actual accounting of of how much time we spent on different items. Well, where I'm going with this is to see whether I could get you to take my place on the agenda committee and I'll give you two crap voices. He's already counting up Megan minutes. <laughs> I'm already working with AJ on something else. If he'll let me use it as a homework assignment, I would happily take your spot. <laughs> you get your draft choices and a hundred grand. I think that's people it. always want to double dip. What is that about? Uh, <laughs> Uh, what you see going forward in the agenda, this it's indicated in May, but again, just remember all that's flexible based on how long uh, you spend in listening. What you see then is that eventually, after the board has gotten clear about its goals and guardrails, the next step in the process is then the superintendent comes back and says, here are the interim goals and here are the interim guardrails. Here, here are the progress measures uh, that we'll be using as an administration to monitor our progress relative to the goals and our progress relative to the guardrails. And, and when we talk about doing monitoring each month where you're receiving monitoring reports for your superintendent, the data that you're receiving is the interim goals and the interim guardrails. So, you're, so these, are, these are, again, smart goals, both of them, are, are, are written in smart format, rather. Your interim goals and your interim guardrails are both written in smart format. So these are very measurable. And the whole intention of these is so we can see, are we getting closer uh, to the end zone or not? Um, the, the key difference here is that your goals are student outcomes. So those are really summative assessment data that you only get once per year. Your interim goals are student output data. So this is a formative and interim data that you get throughout the year. So you say, here's where we want to be at the end of the year. And the superintendent says, here's the data set that if we're doing good on this, it means we're probably doing good on this as well. Um, and so, the, you know, as the uh, person whose job it is to implement the work, she'll come back to you and say, here are our interim goals. This is how we'll progress measure uh, whether or not we're getting close to the goals. Here are interim guardrails. Here's how we'll progress measure whether or not we're honoring uh, the guardrails that the board's put in place. Um, and uh, and she'll also bring forward a draft monitoring calendar. Here's when that data becomes available so that we can know when is the best time for the board to monitor these things when the data is most fresh. If we get a fresh batch of student learning data uh, in uh, February, then the best time to monitor that is in March because uh, it's still fresh. We, if we get it in February, we don't want to wait till June to review it because then it's too late for there to be any adjustments made. And so she'll bring the interim goals, the interim guardrails, and then based on those, a monitoring calendar. Here's the thing about the monitoring calendar. It'll be a five-year calendar. You'll know five years in advance exactly what data are we looking at in which month and which year. Um, there won't be any gotchas. There won't be any surprises. You know, everybody's on the same page. You know, February of 2022, we're looking at this. In April of 2023, we're looking at that. In October of 2024, we're looking at that. You'd be very clear about what is our expectation to our superintendent 
here's the data we expect to see, the exact data we expect to see, and the exact month in which we expect to see it. Um, what often happens is boards that aren't this disciplined, um, either they look at stuff randomly, which feels like gotcha, rather than actual monitoring, or they aren't intentional about what data they're supposed to be looking at. And so the superintendent brings some cherry picks data that is articulated to make things look good, not to give you a sense of what reality is. And so this is what a monitoring calendar does for you. It takes all of the gamesmanship out of it on both the board side and the superintendent side. So everybody can say, here is the data that we have agreed upon is the data that will let us know, are we putting points on the boards for kids or are we failing for kids? Um, and so that's what that's what all of that is about. And on the timeline, it indicates early May, but again, it's whenever it comes up in the timeline based on your listening. Once you have that, then you can evaluate everything. Uh, and then you come back and you know do more listening around that. Um, and then on this timeline, it currently says, you know, the board reviews the draft proposed goals and guardrails in July, and then the board adopts the goals and guardrails in August and adopts the monitoring calendar and everything else. It also says then during that month, that the board evaluates the superintendent, we're in August of 2021, that the board evaluates the superintendent solely on accomplishment of the goals and honoring of the guardrails. Once you've adopted these, that is the basis for evaluating your superintendent. Um, the way you'll know she did her job, did she make a, did she make the agreed upon progress toward the goals while honoring the guardrails? And this is how you'll monitor, this is how you will evaluate everything. How will you know whether or not to vote on the budget? Real simple. Uh, has she provided evidence that it will help you accomplish the goals while honoring guardrails? How do we know if we should approve, you know, um, whatever items are being recommended to us by a superintendent. What evidence has she provided that it uh, helps us accomplish the goals while honoring the guardrails? This becomes your way of creating organizational alignment, uh, you know, vertically throughout all of the adult behavior of the organization by grounding all of your decisions and by proxy all of her decisions. And is this getting us closer to the goals while honoring the guardrails? Um, and those wind up on this timeline currently wind up being adopted in August. Um, and then you can begin, and then it says in September, the superintendent uh, begins, you know, development of the five-year strategic plan on how she'll implement that. So she can't really, uh, so fortunately, you're in the middle of a plan right now. So you've got time, you know, time is on your side. Um, and so, but she can't really start developing the next plan until you all say, here's the community's vision, here's the community values. And so once you adopt that in August or whenever you adopt it, then in the following month, that's when she can get started. And then hopefully uh, sometime in the you know three to four months after that, she can come back and say, okay, here is our new five-year implementation plan to accomplish the board's goals um, while honoring the board's guardrails. And you see that indicated here in February 2022. Um, and so that is our implementation timeline. Um, at this point, what questions do you have? Questions or comments? Uh, now that we've talked through this whole thing, Eric. With the implementation timeline, um, I'm going to sound like a hypocrite for a second because yeah, yeah, you yeah. want it <laughs> because you want it to be a firm set of standards that does not change or fluctuate, so that mm -hmm. you can get the consistency, a positive or negative, that you were looking for from the beginning. And then I'm going to say all of that and say, is there some flexibility with updating and changing guardrails and or uh, items that influence that? Uh, so you're so it so it depends. So first, you all the school board, y'all can do whatever you want to. Like it, <laughs> if you all govern poorly, you won't go to jail for that. Right. Um, and and that, no, yeah, my question is not not if it's <laughs> correct. Is it fair? That's more of what my it is what fair specifically? The changing or updating of guardrails in the midst of trying to reach. An oh, goal. gotcha. So there, there's two major problems with it. One is if you, because this is the basis of your evaluation of your superintendent, anytime you change something in the middle, you don't get to hold her accountable for that until at least 12 months later. Like if her evaluation is five months from now and we change something right now, we don't get to hold her accountable in five months the first opportunity to hold her accountable would be in 17 months. Does that make sense? 
So that's part of your problem is you essentially undermine your own superintendent accountability system because you can't hold someone accountable for something on an annual evaluation if you didn't give them the entire annual <laughs> to implement. Um, and so that's that's the that's the first problem you run into. Uh, the other problem you run into is uh, the more frequently you modify your goals and guardrails, the less likely it is that you're going to be able to create um, alignment organizationally for it. Because what will happen is you'll say, people, these, this is the vision and values of our community. We've got to win at these things. And then people are like, okay, well, you know, let's get after it. Then they'll start running and running. And you'd be like, well, hold up, hold up. What we meant was, it's really this thing over here. And instantly, half of the people are going to be like, oh, okay, we'll go over here. And the other half of the people will be like, but I thought it was this thing. We're just going to keep working on this thing. And then you change it again and you keep splitting and dividing. This is happening in a lot of school systems where you have people who are kind of low key under the radar, still implementing, you know, something, you know, from a decade ago that the rest of the district has abandoned uh, because it's not as optimal for children. But they're still doing because things change so frequently that they just grab something and say, we're just going to stick with this no matter what. I actually had one school that I visited. Um, and while I was visiting, I was visiting classrooms um, and some weird music came up. It was an elementary school. Weird music came over the loudspeaker. And I'm like, you all, this is an elementary school. You all have music for changing classrooms? Like, oh, no, no, no. That's just the music that lets us know that somebody from central office is in the building. And so all the teachers know to swap out the curriculum to pull out what they're supposed to be using. And then when the music goes off, they know that the person has left the building and so they can put the official curriculum away and go back to what they, okay, this is, I don't make up stories, y'all. I just tell you what I have seen with these. Um, and so, what, but I don't blame that building for that behavior nearly as much as I blame that board for that behavior. Because what they've been living with is <clears throat> literally every 18 months in this particular district, the board had gone for a, a 18 year period or for a 15 year period of changing out superintendents every 18 months. Well, after a while, the board staff just stopped responding to superintendent leadership. Um, you could have the same superintendent for 18 years, but if the board pushes the superintendent in a new direction every 18 months, you're going to start hearing a lot more music in your school buildings. So that's the challenge that you face. If you really want to create aligned adult behavior, uh, the, the re harsh reality is you're going to have to be consistent in what you want them to align to long enough for them to get good good at it. And then ideally, uh, in the future, they're making tweaks and adjustments, not wholesale priority changes. Yeah, and I guess that's the part where I'm struggling a little mm -hmm. bit because I'll ask you a personal question. Is your life any dif different than what it was 18 months ago? It's a little bit different. <laughs> but is it any different than it was 36 months ago? Quite a bit. It, was it different two years ago? Indeed. Absolutely. And so you know, as people, there is this natural change that happens outside of the things that you have control oh, yeah. of. Absolutely. And so understanding that that's going to happen within uh, human lifestyle, that same type of change that we recognize as natural and we don't have control over mm -hmm. is going to happen inside of our district. And so mm -hmm. as we put these guardrails in place, there are going to be things that we say, This, these are the principles that we want the oh, success yeah. of our district to uh, be governed under. And we trust you, Jill, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, continue within this alignment. And then something's going to change. Yep. COVID-22, I'm not going to speak this into existence, <laughs> yeah, right. but let's say, right? <laughs> right? And then it's a con yeah. total kerfuffle and we have to, and so I, I, that's where I guess I'm not, once again, trying to be a contrarian. My question yeah. is, is how do you navigate when those types of things happen? Because so, so, in all honesty, I think that they're natural to happen. So, so yes and no. I can show you boards who in response to COVID-19 completely set aside all of their goals, all of their guardrails, and instead re refocused their energy around how are we addressing uh, this pandemic? Mm -hmm. uh, that's reasonable behavior. Right. I can also show you boards 
who in response to COVID-19 changed none of their goals and none of their guardrails and said, we actually don't care about the pandemic. That's her job. What we actually care about is can little AJ read? And we don't care what the circumstances are. Your job as a superintendent is to figure it out or find a different job. So I, so you have the authority to, in the face of the vicissitudes of reality that we can't control, um, to kind of be kind of a steady, uh, steady force in in the face of all of that. If that's what makes the most sense for your community, or to be kind of the yielding force in the face of that, if that makes the most sense for your community. What I'm suggesting is don't assume that either one of those is automatically the right answer. Don't assume that just because stuff happens, you all have to shift around to modify to it. It could be that your expectation that what serves your children best is for you to be stalwart in the face of it. Like, no, 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 no. We're not going to spend the next year talking about does little AJ have a hot spot. We're going to spend the next year talking about can little AJ read. Right. And, and, and let me tell you this, these two districts, the one that spent none of its time on COVID as a board and the one that spent all of its time as COVID as a board, both of them wound up implementing the exact same COVID plan. Hmm. The board's constant involvement in this one didn't actually make a meaningful difference in what the superintendent wound up doing. The board felt better about it and better informed and they were better able to communicate it. But the ultimate plan wasn't meaningfully changed by the board's involvement. What I can tell you is this other one that spent all of their time focused on can little AJ read or not? I guarantee you this. Come back and check with me in six months. I guarantee you money today. Um, the, the one, the board that stayed focused on student learning, their children are going to be better off uh, academically than the board that um, stopped focusing on that and started focusing on do we have laptops? Do we have things like that? Both boards made a choice. And I think both choices were exactly right for their respective communities. So the moral of this isn't one choice is right, one choice is wrong. The moral of this is you will always have a choice. Um, right. Do you all kind of bend and yield to you know, the circumstances or do you remain unyielding in that? And I think that's a conversation you all need to have. I would never encourage you just to be responsive to the next fire because there's always going to be a next fire. Correct. There's always going to be a next fire. Thank yeah, you. Megan. No, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, just surfacing that. That's a really important thing to look up. Uh, you talked about the calendar for interim goals would be the three to five years. And I know we talked about it in November, but can we do a refresher on when we set these potential three to five? I know you said three goals, three to five goals. Um, ideally, that is over a four to five year time mm -hmm. frame. Could, and I think you touched on it a little bit just now. Could you speak to why having that vision forward, even though I think for some folks, it's going to feel like we're not talking about enough things all the time, but you know, the rationale between a long-term set of goals with interim goals and then that calendar of um, yeah. information so that the, comes to us. Yeah. The, the underlying challenge here, um, and, it, and it's always hard for people to understand, you're going to spend the next five years explaining it to people. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's just the nature of leadership is you're constantly, um, creating the vision and explaining why this is the vision to folks. And that's just what leadership looks like. You know, but the, the, the fundamental element here, um, we rely on, uh, and uh, I, I think I shared this already, but you've got two new board members, so I'll say it again. We rely on, you know, a study done, you know, by the uh, Franklin Covey folks that looked at the relationship between how many goals does an organization have and the organization's likelihood to accomplish the goals. And what they found was that organizations that had between zero to three goal, between one and three goals, any guess how many goals they were likely to accomplish? One to three. Yeah. Uh, and organizations that had four to six goals, any idea how many they were likely to accomplish? Seven. One to two. And organizations that had seven to 11 goals, any guess how many they were likely to accomplish? One to two. Okay. Zero. The more things you focus on and the more you shift around the things you focus on, the less likelihood that you will be able to um, inspire the degree of organizational alignment necessary to accomplish them. That is what the evidence suggests to us. The more things you focus on and the more that you move the target around, the more you move the goalpost on people, 
the less likelihood you will be able to create the organizational alignment necessary to achieve breakthrough results. And here's what's at stake. Here, here's, what, uh, here's what the data across the country seems to say, is that the students with the greatest privilege will survive this and be fine. Your lack of effective leadership will not create inescapable harm for your most privileged children. Guess what the other half of that sentence is? However, that's what's at stake. Mm -hmm. Like you have children who are academically vulnerable and who are in great need and who lack the same privileges that other of your children lack. At the end of all accounting, who you serve um, depend, you know, is heavily impacted by how well you govern. If you govern marginally well, you serve your most uh, privileged children. If you serve really well, you have an opportunity to serve all children. Other questions or comments? Uh, we're starting to wind down our time. These, these are the main conversations we need to get. I've got the next steps and the information that I need in order to serve you all next and to get you all moving on the next pieces of this journey. Uh, what are the questions, comments do you have? Yeah, Juan. Yeah, AJ, and I need to um, go uh, in a bit, but but one of the things that I most appreciate, you, you you started off asking us sort of what, why are we doing this, right? Why are we excited? Yeah. What are our thoughts? Um, one of the things that I took away from November when you shared sort of the preliminary aspects of this work uh, in terms of evaluating ourselves as a board is um, it addresses the challenge that I personally have as a school board member. And I, and I want to be cognizant of this, knowing that we have two new school board members here and two school bo board members that were here before me. So I'm going to share this del delicately, right? Uh, but as a community member, now a school board member, there is a culture of, of the way things were done in our school district. And I think it was partially a product of, we had two superintendents that were here almost three, dec three decades, yeah. right? Between both of them. And, and, and we have a new superintendent uh, here who came who's in. Gonna, who's going to be here for three decades, right? right? Well, hopefully, right? Hopefully. But she started in the midst of sort of this context that we're having this meeting. And so, the worst time. <laughs> right? And, and so um, on the one hand, all the things that our district did well, um, when we evaluated ourselves in November, we did well in spite of yeah. the, way, the way we evaluated ourselves, right? So I think for me, it, it, that, that's part of the both challenge but benefit that I get from this process and yeah. from these conversations that um, I, I really do think that it would have been hard in this context that we're in with the pandemic to try and engage in the similar kind of conversation when historically our district has done very well uh, in some areas, uh, but that this pandemic that we're in on many levels does exacerbate some of the inequities that may have been there pre-existing, but they're magnified. So coming out of this pandemic, I think it would have been really tough, right? To think, oh, let's engage in a board development uh, process <laughs> as we're coming yeah. out of the pandemic, right? So just wanted to share that as an appreciative statement uh, for my colleagues, for myself, because I, I think it helps me reconcile this challenge of we did all these things well with a lot of room for improvement in other areas, but really I don't think, you know, I could be hopeful, I could be wrong, that we would have engaged in this conversation if we weren't magnifying a lot of the challenges yeah. that we're facing as a district, particularly our most vulnerable students uh, in the yeah. district. So I wanted to share that because I, I I didn't want to leave this meeting today because I have to without sharing my my hope uh, and my appreciation uh, for for our district district taking on like you said this this commitment this effort and upholding it on our end, uh, but in the midst of the the challenges that we're facing right as a school system. So thanks. Amy. Yeah. No, I, I share your admiration for the team uh, that you serve as part of, and excited to uh, join you all in a absurd quantity of work that you were taking on you know, over the next six month period. Uh, other questions, comments, as we start to wind down, other questions or comments uh, about this particular timeline and the work ahead. Yeah, Diana. 
Um, well, I'd like to revisit our list of uh, community engagement and yeah. outreach. Okay, I'm and, there. Um, I'm noticing we didn't include any student groups or any teacher groups, and um, maybe could we add some? Student groups, teacher groups, got it. Thank you. And like I said, you all will have plenty of time to do some brainstorming. You'll be populating this. That's, that's part of the next steps you'll get from us. Any other reflections before we start to wind down? Yeah, Megan? Yeah, I just want to um, continue what Dr. Benitez was talking about, and I know I've talked with Dr. Baker about that we in this district have, um, we have lots of traditions um, that we get to revisit at this time. But one of them that I'm proud of is the idea that we really work on a continuous improvement model at every level with our teachers, with our staff. Um, and so I'm excited, uh, a little daunted by the work that's in front of us that the board is choosing to do some of this continuous improvement model at our level, that we're not exempt from the work that we expect of our superintendent, of our teachers, of all of our staff. Um, and we're gonna do it in a very public way. Yeah. So um, unlike some of the other folks who mm -hmm. are doing this a little more privately. So I just want to thank my colleagues um, and the team and Dr. Baker uh, for engaging in this work, which is surely to be uncomfortable, is certainly being watched and critiqued by folks. Um, I am the first person to admit that I am not perfect in my work as a school board member. And there are ways that I can improve so that student outcomes are better. And I that's my commitment to this work. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there and thanks to my colleagues for engaging in the work. Wow. Uh, any other closing comments as we uh, wrap up our time? Any other closing comments? Uh, well, I am just grateful and I know on you know, Monica's behalf, she's working with another board right now, otherwise she would have been here. Uh, um, uh, so we're kind of playing double duty. Um, uh, I, I, I got you all tonight. Um, next time is probably she'll get you all and I'll get somebody else. But really grateful uh, just to get the opportunity to connect with you all. Um, i excited, excited about the work. Um, you know, Monica said she had a great uh, time Monday night hanging out with Doug and Eric. Um, that just means you all need to be meaner next time. Apparently, you weren't mean enough. So that's something for you to grow in. Uh, if you could work on your mean expression, Doug, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, it, we talked, hey, we, Eric and I talked and we decided that we would use Monday to set her up. <laughs> she, she thinks it's going to be good going. <laughs> She's got something else coming. <laughs> but we we are really excited, uh, especially, and I'll just say this, you know, no shade on everybody else. A lot of the times when we get pulled in, it's because um, there has been a major problem um, and we're there to help districts clean up uh, poor you know, behavior administratively or board. You all are an aberrant in that regard and that we've been pulled in largely because of you all gone through a transition is really, I, I think, a large part of the reason we're here. Um, and since you've got a major transition on your board and a major transition in executive leadership. Um, I got to tell you, it is a lot of fun to get with, to be with a board that is already on the rise. And our role is just to help you rise faster, not a board that is on the ground trying to figure out which way is up. And so just uh, for your willingness to reach out and pull us into it. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Back to you. I, I was having trouble unmuting. Sorry about that. Well, we are very grateful, you know, for you and for Monica in helping us through this process. Um, I'm I'm grateful for our new superintendent. I'm grateful grateful for my colleagues and our staff. Um, we continue to do better for the students and. I think the part that I like to focus on is I do represent a certain district within our school district, but I serve all kids. And I've said this at meetings and it's at the core of what I do. And I know that I'm not the only one that feels this way. And I think that's part of our success is that at the core of everything, we just care about the students. So thank you so much for helping us through this process. Um, I, I am a little concerned at the joy you're, you're getting out of the you know, sheer workload that you're gonna be 
putting on us. But I I do look forward to it and I look forward to working with everybody on this. So I guess with that, if there's nothing further, uh, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone.